The last time I talked about this, uh, I suppose, was in 2016, and it was at a Eurasian Academy there. They were a little, a little bit louder. Um, it, it was in the Eurasian Academy, and it was a very mixed audience from the church, from politics, from science, some people very pro-IPCC, others a little bit more skeptical and so on. It was a good mixed version, and I'll tell you what I was talking about there. Basically, it was this absolute confidence by IPCC in, um, in, in their scientific interpretation. Now, I'm an Uppsala, uh, and we've been retired for quite a while. I've only been there for uh, 25 years. Um, we have in Uppsala not only a full range of disciplines, theological disciplines, but we also have a center of excellence uh, in sustainable development. The, the excellence is not always there, but it's sense. Um, it's it's a strong enough um, organization, I think, to uh, invite to Holland Burns Sunday over sometime, and we will certainly try and do that. He, uh, he stands on his feet. But they, of course, are, are very green in the sense that they're very, very conscious about the planet uh, and the sustainable, sustainability sides of it, and very, very concerned about the ethics. And I try to say to them, yes, the ethics is extremely important, but you must get into science, at least at schoolboy level or schoolgirl level, to understand the science before you decide how the ethics And of course in Sweden, as you know, perhaps in Norway as well, you are multiplying the number of communicators every day by a few thousand, and none of these people have a scientific background. So okay, having said that, and given you a bit, bit of my back, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to drag you back into the lithosphere a bit, make you understand that side of it. But we can start over here and um, look at that graph. This is the terrifying graph of um, small, of the last, it's difficult to see, isn't it? Ah, here we are. That's better. Um, of the last 40 years. I guess you're all familiar with this graph. Um, there are a couple of major institutes in the United States who discuss these things and uh, are in on the whole business of what they are measuring here. It's lower, global lower atmosphere temperature. Um, how high above ground is it? Well, it must be above ground everywhere, so I think it's in the order of 9,000 meters. But that gives us a very good control of what's happening in the lower atmosphere over the last 40 years. I wanted to show you this and put it into a Swedish perspective before we roll on. All right, so here we are. This is 40 years of warming. Um, this is 1979, 2018, nearly 19. I want to just give you the Swedish perspective on this by looking back to what was happening from 1979 through and how by about 1980, well, here, we were in the beginning of IPCC, and then we were in IPCC's flourishing first 10 years when Bert Wallin was chairman, and uh, we had a sudden El Nino, a really good one at 1997-98, sliding into 99 a little, uh, which raised temperature by, by about half a degree, and then zoomed it back down again. Uh, and we'll look at these details in more uh, later, but I wanted to say this, that 79 was an interesting time in Sweden because um, then we'd be more or less agreed that what we were aiming at, 50% electricity from hydro, all, practically all in Lapland, whether the Samis liked it or not. And as you probably know, the British government doesn't, doesn't treat the Samis particularly well. We can always come back to that. But um, they'd come to an agreement that this took about 50%, I think it's six rivers, will be dammed, and the other 50% will be nuclear. 
1979, we had six reactors built. We had six reactors being built. And a huge investment. And then, as you possibly remember, we had Three Mile Island. The accident on the coast of uh, on the New England. Uh, again, well, not again. This was the first really serious one, but they it didn't it didn't uh, give a big problem. But it told us how vulnerable nuclear is, and how careful we have to be. And since then, I mean, they got away with it in, in America, but subsequent to that, in Chernobyl and in uh, Fukushima, uh, they were appalling man-made errors, huge errors, and quite unnecessary errors. We can talk about that more. And though that first one triggered a discussion in the Socialist Party uh, uh, as to whether this should go on. And to, to the decision, we had a referendum, as you remember, and the decision of that referendum was that we would phase out the nuclear in 30 years, but the investment we had made with twelve reactors, with, with ten reactors, but with building six and building six more would go through. Okay, so this gives you a situation in 1980, say, when we were 50-50. Very well set up, very reliable electric. Um, but uh, with a decision that they were eventually going to be closed, and therefore we had to find some more. And we had this interesting situation where Sweden... Um, was then hunting for alternative energies. And the uh, Vattenfall, you know, Vattenfall is this, uh, the electricity, hydroelectricity company in Sweden, were told that about um, 500 million of their normally 1,000 million profits every year should be invested in finding alternative energy. And if any of you remember this, they went around looking for all kinds of alternatives and one of them was heat. And we had the most brilliant volcano we will ever have in Uppsala when they brought down too much peat into Uppsala and kept it in one place ready to be fed into the, 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 uh, the distant, distant heating plant. And it caught fire. And it burnt for a week. And it was decided that they really ought to be more sensible and find alternatives. And so the government said, okay, come on, you've got to look all over the world. And they found, as you might remember, Tom Gold in uh, USA, who firmly believed in the Russian um, hypothesis that there was methane coming out of the mantle in vast quantities, and you had to be able to trap it. Now, I'm telling you this just to make it clear in your minds that Sweden was then fully engaged in, in, the, in the possibility of having hydrocarbons. And very disappointed that they didn't have star oil. They didn't have everything that Norway had. Little Brother had all these fantastic uh, uh, things that we would like to have. And although there had been previously discussions about, okay, the problems with carbon dioxide, we weren't worried about then. We went with Tom Gold into the field of drilling for methane in the ground to large depths. Um, when they consulted with Tom Gold, and I was, remember being strongly opposed to him then, um, he, he said, well, now look, you've got this fantastic a meteorite impact in, in, in uh, Middle Sweden, the Cillian impact structure. It's the biggest one in Europe. And that will have crushed the, the crust enough to, for methane to be seeping through. So we go in there and we drill it. And we wrote newspaper articles saying, this is just crazy. They're selling it as North Sea oil, but uh, on the chance, practically not. Anyway, Jeff physicists on the other side said, well, we should try anyway. Worthwhile test chest testing, because they were interested in being financed to do the geophysics. And it was a good idea. They did very well out of it, and several of my colleagues did. But we drilled six and a half kilometers twice to try and find some. And so by about, um, oh, 1985, um, Sweden has spent a hell of a lot of taxpayers' money, two holes down to six and a half kilometers, 
God, I guess some geophysicists really secretly rather glad to have this information. Um, but um, a total failure. And that failure, to the last attempt to find hydrocarbons or some kind of fossil energy in Sweden, led to a concentration in the end of the 80s and into the early 90s in, on IPCC. And I want to tell you a bit more about that detail. And we'll go on. I think we'll just zoom on from there. But you've got the, you've got, let's just keep mixing. We've got this in our mind. We had this, um, gradual increase through into the 90s, very flat. Then suddenly the first El Nino here coming, zooming up. It must have been a bit of one here. But, and then, and then went on through. There was a, uh, pretty well flat all the way through here in the early 2000s. And I could never understand during those early 2000s. How could that flat temperature after the leap year, how could that flat result in the peace prize? How could it lead to the peace prize? Was it, was it a question of really about global peace? Or was it a peace between Sweden and Norway? I don't know. But that, but that was extraordinary. And of course, by then, the politicians had been tampering with the school books. So that a lot of our children get uh, pretty peculiar, uh, well, they have pretty peculiar thoughts about carbon dioxide. I'll be coming back to this again. And since then, it's gone on, and the last El Nino nearly is just slightly bigger than this one. The peaks are, peaks are slightly higher. It's all on a one, not quite one degree per decade, one degree centigrade per um, century. Terrifying. And yet we're living in this world where they're trying to terrify us. There was an article in the Swedish newspaper, oh gosh, only three weeks ago, 87 people writing, we've got to change our political system. We need a benevolent dictator to steer the class, to steer the world into the right way. If it leads to a reduction or breakdown of capitalism too bad, um, we must save the planet. And there was a refuge afterwards. But of course, with all these things, it's the first thing that makes an impact and afterwards. Complete madness. And that at least inspires us to go out against it. So, having said all that about fear, I want to take you on into a bit more of the politics. Uh, let's make sure we go going in the right direction. Yes. Um, but what, during the 90s, um, when Bert Bullin was boss, um, and towards the end of the 90s, I, I, I was in the, the Royal Society as well. Um, we were having our lithosphere meetings and our excitement, and I'm going to talk about that. At the same time, coming back to the Royal Society and discussing um, climate. And I mean, I was trying to say, Bert, look, let's put the brakes on. We need to know more, to have more time to assess the ongoing changes in the weather. And the climate, I mean, you've told me that it takes 30 or 40 years to, to, to estimate whether we've got a real climate change or not, and even that's a bit too short. And Bert would reply, no, David, you can't risk the planet. We really can't risk the planet. Now, I could talk to you for another half an hour or hour about all our discussions. And all the time it was Bert saying with extreme confidence, total certainty, that, um, well, the warming of the medieval was just a North Atlantic affair. It had nothing to do with global change. Oh, the little ice age was just a, a hemispheric affair. Um, certainly had nothing to do with the southern hemisphere. Today, now, we have global change because of the increase in carbon dioxide. And we all knew that the modeling was a modeling of in a very simple-minded way because the modeling was taking passive molecules, carbon dioxide and water, and of course they're not passive. And I try to say it to him, and I try to say to people now, don't forget carbon dioxide and, and uh, water. They're more or less gods, because without them, 
There is no life on earth. No plant kingdom, no animal kingdom, no life at all. And therefore, why not, like in a greenhouse, feed more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and wait and see what happens? Anyway, that's moving on, jumping on a bit too far. Um, okay, what the amazing thing, well, of course, if we, if I just uh, went back, well, I can, I can go on. I think one. Uh -huh. Was that going on or going back? No. Yeah. Okay. Now this is what I'm going to do from here. Um, this is, this, I'm going to take you into lithosphere science. Just, just give you an idea of the contrast between trying, between trying to do science where you weigh hypotheses against each other, have lots of different lines of evidence coming in, trying to make up your mind, turning a hypothesis into a paradigm, but never actually having fact in our hands. I mean, we have Darwin's evolution theory, and that's a marvelous paradigm, which most of us accept more or less as fact, but we know we're not a fact, and there's a whole world ahead of us that we will never see that we will be looking at this. So, okay, I wanted to compare a bit of this to, to the situation in coming back to the Royal Society discussing with Bert. And then I wanted to come in quickly on IPCC and then start doing a little bit of climate here, the temperature, the CO2 sequestration in the past. And this is the enormously important thing that is going on. And uh, as geologists, we tend to spend our time thinking about uh, sequestration in the bedrock, putting the carbon dioxide back into the bedrock. And that is certainly an interesting way we can go if we have to go. But the first sequestration, the brilliant sequestration, is here. And we can wait, uh, take a bit of time on that and then uh, touch on this and the, and the future. So let's go into lithosphere science just to give you a feeling for the difference between the science that we were involved in in the lithosphere and the science in, of, of climate. Um, Yes. Um, back again then. We're, we're in this zone here. We've had all the experience of trying to do hydrocarbons in Sweden, and then we came into this period here before Bert Bolin uh, retired. And he retired brilliantly, right at the right, at the right time, because he got exactly what he wanted, a sudden jump in temperature into this belt. Now, during this, this time here, the 90s, we were having a marvelous time in the lithosphere with a completely different kind of science. I wonder whether I'm going the right way. Yes. Yeah. This is what we were doing. We had projects all over Europe, uh, nine or ten of them. Uh, from the Urals all the way to Iberian Peninsula, this was totally mixed geology, geophysics, um, geochemistry, but obviously stratigraphy and structure and all these other things all mixed together. And all of these disciplines met in workshops and interacted. And this was really science being debated. And we know um, it, it was so totally different from climate science, where there was a modeling of a particular uh, molecule and assuming that it was a simple passive player telling us how dangerous it might be. Um, to bring you more closer, closer to home, I mean, Jotunheimen has been a marvelous place in the Caledonides, in our mountains, for having discussions of, of, of the whole history of the Caledonian mountain belt. Here you have the highest point in the whole of the, Scan the, the Scandinavian mountains, made up of some rocks which are rather heavy, and how one had a geological interpretation, which was that it had been picked up from out offshore Norway and moved here by thrusting, which we have up, 
And the other hypothesis, that it was, always, and always had been, there is. And of course, we went in with different methods. We looked at the uh, magnetic data, the gravity data. We didn't have any seismic data. And, and then we looked at the rocks around and how these thing was lying. And the first estimates, if we'd had Eva with us, then he would have been interested. There you go. They, of course, they, they had, they thought, well, there must be a deep root on this thing. Uh, and the geologist said, well, that deep root can't be too deep because otherwise we'd have never got it into where it is. And uh, because it was difficult to do the seismics there, um, we, we went in with various other methods, and of course we went in with the structure around the, the, the mountain. And now I think we are, 99% of us agree, that yes, it's not so deep as we thought. It's always a question of estimating what's underneath and what's up. And it has come from west of the Norwegian coast and transported a long way. Um, but we're still, still in the whole discussion of exactly how did it get there and what is the structure around it. The thing is still open. All I'm trying to say is the lithosphere is still open. And the meteorologists are trying to say there's no more discussion. And any opposition, and it is totally mad in my opinion. And I have another thing I should mention, and we could talk about this for a long, long time, is of course volcanism. We've heard quite a lot when we talk to meteorologists about the aerosol. Huh? Very little about CO2. But the aerosols, of course, are very effective for reducing temperature and actually do have quite an impact over a relatively short period of time. But the huge question, and I've talked to my volcanological friends about this, is how much carbon dioxide are we producing? And uh, isn't the production of carbon dioxide from volcan volcanoes today rather low? Looking back in time into the times when the volcanicity was very, very much greater, very difficult to say, because you see, we can tie down the old volcanicity to a million years, perhaps, but it's difficult to say how much it was increasing over a period of a hundred years. But still, this could be a very important factor, which is not, basically not um, taken into account. However, having said that, I would like to... Oops, the wrong way. I'd like to take you on now, and take you more into the... Um, into the temperature changes, into the carbon dioxide influence on the temperature, and then now I, I put this up for you, and I put it up for you for one special reason, because uh, you read read the Economist, you see the Economist of last week, that's a huge attack on the oil industry and on now I haven't written them I haven't sent my letter yet but I was going to say to them don't forget what you wrote in 2009 a profound insight there is no doubt that politics and science make uncomfortable bedfellows politicians sell certainty science lives off doubt the creation of the Intergovernmental IPCC to establish a consensus on the science was an excellent idea for politicians. They needed a strong scientific foundation for their uh, deliberations and their actions. But it sits uncomfortably with a discipline that advances by disproving accepted things and overturning oxes. And it's that fundamental thing. The economist understood it. Ten years ago, it looks as if they've got a younger generation of journalists in now. And then, just trying to emphasize this again and again and again, I try to get into the heads of our people in working with these things, with, uh, with sustainability and things in, in Uppsala. 
all scientists know they don't know. They have hypotheses which they try to turn into paradigm. Yet we have to follow Einstein. It's vital for science that hypotheses are not bought by politicians, IPCC, yeah. and IPCC has broken all the rules of basic science. We could also dwell on that for a while, but let's move on. Um, some some years ago, I could call myself an agnostic. I mean, it wasn't really then. I mean, I'd talked enough to Bert Pauline to have a much a, 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 a preferred view. But at the same time, we're scientists. We can't rule out the alternatives. And so it's all the time going back to Bert. Look, Bert, we need time. We can't make a decision it's on 15 or 20 years of warming. We've got to wait and see how the planet reacts to increasing carbon dioxide. Um, I'm afraid that we've now learnt how the planet reacts, and it's truly amazing. And let's go on a bit. Um, this is what I talked about in Finland at the um, Eurasian meeting. Um, political purposes. It was a question of Really, how is IPCC handling this, this question of weather and climate and the like? And uh, the very, very confident and clear statements that are made by IPCC, which I protested rather great. Yeah. This is the foreword to the ninth, the 2013 Stockholm meeting. Very interesting meeting in Stockholm. We had them there for a week. 200 countries were represented. They were negotiating day and night over the wording of the report to make certain that there was some money for everyone. And in this case, it's science now shows us with 90% certain, 95% certainty that human activity is the dominant cause of the observed warming of the mid century. In other words, more than half of the warming from 1950 to 2000, 2010. But equally, you know, you could have said, the science now shows that 95% certainty that natural change is the dominant cause. Natural change. Two statements. But we know that we have no idea what natural change is going to be doing in a month's time, in a year's time, in 10 years' time, in 50 years' time. Yet our communes in Sweden are planning for what they're going to do in 10 years' time or 20 years' time when the sea level is up and the, and, and the, and the, and the forest fires are more frequent and the storms are, you know, it, it's absolutely crazy because we could just as well have a turn down or a dramatic increase. And so we just got to monitor and follow the record. But just just to remind you of the politics, I don't know whether, I hope we're not taking too long, but here are a few people making comments who didn't give a damn about the science. They were senior politicians who were just interested in, you know, we've got to ride the global warming issue even if the theory of global warming is wrong, we'll be doing the right thing in terms of economic policy and environmental policy. A global warming treaty must be implemented, even if there's no scientific evidence to back the greenhouse effect. I mean, there were lots of senior people saying this, and that's why it's got established so quickly and easily. Look at these amazing statements. Chirac. Jacques Chirac. For the first time, Humanity is instituting a genuine instrument of global governance. Global governance, United Nations perhaps. One that should find a place within the world, the environmental organization, which France and et cetera, et cetera. No matter if the science of global warming is all phony. Climate change, the greatest opportunity to bring about justice and equality in the world. And I would say, 
But if you don't look after the sanctity of science, there's disaster. You've got to get the science right. You cannot take a hypothesis and turn it into a fact and then just run with it. That's what the politicians have done. Now, I wanted to take you on. I mean, we, we, we've um, got some of that background, and now I want to look at the, 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 um, the temperature record, but in a bigger perspective, just to have a little bit more background. Um, so let's, let's go to the next one. But, but uh, having looked at that diagram, having looked at the previous one, and seen that there is a gentle increase, you ask yourself, how the hell could IPCC have come with this in 2007, the same time as the Peace Prize was given to, to IPCC and Al Gore was over here to pick up his Peace Prize? And why the choice also not to give the Peace Prize to Doug Pauline? And there are all kinds of intrigues here, I can see. But you know better about, more about this than me because you live in Norway and you follow the, uh, the discussions, I guess. But anyway, I mean, all of this drama I mean, it, it, it was, it was real, really completely false. It was just saying, okay, we look at our models and we can model this. Well, of course you can model what you like. If you're a geophysicist going in and you want to model the thickness of the, uh, oh, huge intrusion up on, uh, in Ceylon where we have a terrific intrusion there. Um, and you can, you can make them as deep as you like, depending upon how you do the modeling. It's crazy. Um, climate models do no more than help us to speculate about the future. All modeling does no more than help us. Speculations and not predictions should not be used as a basis for policy. All models are wrong, but they're very often quite useful. So let's come again back into the the world that we're trying to model. I mean, it's totally obvious. And I mean, I remember very well the left, more Bert Pauline's left hand, that guy called Henry Rudin, writing an article to um, the Svenska Dabladi saying, well, the Achilles heel of the climate change science is how? the inability to model them, and therefore you cannot make any certain statements about what happens when the Earth warms a little. I mean, you're saying with the modeling, very simply, okay, we've got this carbon molecule and we know it's a greenhouse gas molecule and we know it really will cause warming. And if we warm the planet, then we release more water vapor. And water vapor is much more important for warming than CO2. Therefore, we dramatically increase the impact. And they said this quite happily. And if you can't, you can't in any way model the formation and dissipation of clouds. You, you can't draw any of those conclusions. I mean, even people who have known nothing about science have sat out in the sun on our one nice day in the spring and suddenly the clouds have come in and turned the temperature down. We all know that clouds have an incredible effect on temperature and that none of these models can take this into account. You have to make assumptions about it. Making assumptions, making significance all the time. Now let's move on. Um, oh yes, just a comment. Water vapor is the most important greenhouse gas without an understanding of how clouds form and dissipate. You have no hope of this. I haven't given the name of the person here because he didn't want his name cited. But uh, he was a very prominent meteorologist. And of course, there are a scattering of very prominent meteorologists around the world who are very strongly opposed by PCC. But most of them have to retire before they can go out and do anything. Because if they want to finance their institutes, they have to use the party line. So, looking just at the, 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 um, 
context. But think about this question of carbon dioxide. Um, you know the birth of the Earth, that's not so interesting, I suppose, but about 3,000 million years ago, there were the first signs, the microbes, the microorganisms. But by, by about 2,000 years ago, we are pretty sure there was some oxygen in the atmosphere. It wasn't totally dominated by CO2. Um, we had a, a terrific period, two or three of, 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 um, of ice ages, which were more or less snowball earth. You know, the whole of the land was covered. That was an absolutely terrible time for the biosphere. And after that, the plant and animal kingdom managed to grow. And we had the main evolution. And the conclusion is no doubt any doubt. You carbon dioxide and water, these two things we've been talking about, are absolutely vital. There's no life without them. And why doesn't IPCC tell everyone? We know that carbon dioxide is enormously important. We can't make a de devil out of him. It's actually more of a god. And the photosynthesis, of course. We need the sun. We need the energy for the, for the reactors. But it's terribly important to get this into our children's minds. They, they don't learn this in school. They just learn that carbon dioxide is a problem. Going back, just to see how temperatures have gone. Here we are, temperature. The colder, warmer, about minus 10 degrees. About, about 10 degrees on there. But a bit, bit more, perhaps. But just that, um, going back, this is six million years, five, four, three, two, one. Um, how it <coughs> was warmer here and the Miocene and Pliocene going down into the ice ages and dropping down, uh, with, with, with just cycles of about 40 million, 40,000 years. And then the longer ones with a hundred thousand years that we've experienced in the last, what, 800, thousand years and um, these are extremely interesting because because they're very short intervals of, of, of reasonable warming and they've been absolutely vital for the biosphere if we look at the last 5,000 years we know this graph as well then we're going from the light of little ice age, we're coming out of it now. Uh, we go back. This green bar is not quite in the right place, but it's pretty good. At about a thousand to twelve hundred, there was a very dramatic change at the end of the twelve of twelve hundreds, and then we went on down into the little ice here. And what does the IPCC talk about? It talks about the industrial revolution. Was this controlled by the industrial revolution? This dip, maybe this one, no, and the other ones. Um, and I heard from the, my Norwegian friends that um, you can reckon that at about uh, 1750, one third of the population either died or moved because it was absolute disaster here. And that was about one and a half degrees less than now. And what are they talking about in Paris? And what are they talking about down in Port? Poland, one and a half degrees and we don't be higher than one half. I, I don't understand it. Our meteorological friends always praise Arrhenius. Arrhenius was the king who first showed us that carbon dioxide could be in. And what did Dr. Arrhenius say? Well, in 1910 or perhaps in 1905, he said, God, it's cold. If only it was one or two degrees warmer. But that's some information we don't want anyone to know. The boss of carbon dioxide can't have said a thing like that. It would be great if we, 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 if we can keep on moving out of this and not go back down again like this. It'll make a great difference. Life on Earth. Anyway, let's go on a little bit further. This is the last uh, 1,200 years. And it's pretty well under control. There's more and more work that's been done on proxies. And people have uh, got a better, better control of this. And the temperatures back in the medieval warming 
were approximately what we have now. They might have been a little bit higher then. We haven't had sustained higher temperatures long enough to, to really make a good comparison. In, um, we, we might be somewhere here, moving up. If we're getting a, if we get a repetition of this, but of course we're in a generally downgoing trend. We had the Holocene optimum when temperatures were at least three or four degrees high, and we've gone on down. And, and it, but it's been up and down, up and down, and we may go on going down. I used to say. So let's come back into this world again. Look at the planet. And look at what is happening to the planet as we feed in more and more carbon dioxide. Um, can move on again, I think, from that. Um, we all know this diagram. Uh, this, this very simple gradient it goes on back towards some um, crosses the little ice age temperatures have gone down down to into the little ice age back here um, we know about this we know about these variations and now if you talk to glaciologists they say with complete confidence we've studied glacial retreat and advance all over the world in the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere and about 1860 and 1870, there's no doubt, all glaciers were in, on the retreat. All glaciers were melting. Ah. And then they stopped melting for that. And then they started melting again here. And now they're melting like that here. But already by then, we'd gone past the, the, uh, the, um, well, let me put it this way. I was up on Svalbard doing a lot of work, and I was shown where there was a whaling station. And the whaling station, they knew, had been established in 1709. And there was a sort of relic of a, of a foundation of a house. Right? And they tell me, now look, there you are, 1709. The whalers were having a hell of a time, but they were still there trying. But they were overrun 10 years later by the glaciers. And the glaciers advanced across these whaling stations. And that advance went on, well, several tens of years. And eventually it stopped, they stopped moving. And then, uh, and, and about 50, 50 years again later, um, they, the temperatures uh, got up high enough. And hereabouts, the glaciers started melting. And they were telling me that by about 1870, 1880, we actually found the whaling station again. The glacier had withdrawn far enough. And I thought, well, this is just a Svalbard thing. But apparently, it's not just a Svalbard thing. It's, it, um, this is certainly global. And certainly, it was a northern hemisphere everywhere. So um, I'm sorry this is going on too late for you. Um, if we go on, let's get in on the greenhouse gases then and get, get really stuck into. Um, the, the gases, and um, and what happens? What happens when we put more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? Um, they put in water vapor here. Important point of water is linked to temperature. Uh, this recates that. Now, this, this is a question of positive feedback or negative feedback. Um, it, it, it's all a question of um, whether you're raising temperature or lowering it, or might be. Let's go, let's go on. Let's not get into too much of these details, but this you know. Um, incoming radiation. And the greenhouse gases, keeping some of that heat in the lower atmosphere. And, uh, it's a uh, land surface is warmed, etc. here. There's no question about what is going on. Exactly how it works is not completely clear, but if we go on with this, um, the questions are how much anthropogenic CO2 is being put into the atmosphere every year and how much is being registered as actually staying there. Um, 
I, I never uh, really understood this until a few years ago. But in fact, when we are thinking all the time, well, carbon dioxide is going up by two parts per million per year, and um, um, the, the, um, the, the temperature, of course, is as well. Um, it was never clear that, in fact, a huge amount more carbon dioxide is actually going into the atmosphere. About four parts per million or a little bit more. And so, if we look at this in more detail, climate warming stimulates the plant growth. Yes, it does indeed. And don't worry about whether it's called negative or positive. But um, if, if this is the case, how strong is this action? And I've written it in here at the bottom. And the more the biosphere expands, because this will involve an expansion, the more CO2 will de be demanded. With the greatest pleasure of Earth's amazing security blanket. Let's look into this question here. This is the evidence. It's been published only a few years. The evidence is that the planet indeed is greening. When we go out, in the fields, in the mountains, in Norway, everyone can see it. The trees are reaching up towards the tree line. It's a global phenomenon. There's no question that that um, this, this actually was published in uh, in the Economist as well, um, but in Nature, of course, as well. Um, and if this process is going on, it's quite obvious that the more greenery we have the more the green we can consume. If you look at this, the answer is directly. Can carbon dioxide be a problem in the long term? Well, to me, the answer is absolutely not. We all have some idea about how it works, how much ends up in the atmosphere, where where the the carbon dioxide comes from, partly the, the decay of bio biomass here. Um, we know that of course the oceans are the enormous reservoir. We know a lot about the microbes and how they are using the, the photosynthesis. Um, and and so it's we get an idea, and we're trying to quantify this all the time. Of where is all this going? We we we. We make calculations of how much fossil fuel is being burned all over the world. And then, wow, only half of it, no, less than half of it, is being retained in the atmosphere. Strange. There's a diagram, you can find this on the web, Global Carbon Project. The upper part shows basically what they think we have of increase in carbon dioxide thanks to fossil fuel and industry and, of course, biofuel in quite large quantities. But um, nothing. And you can see that's what the production is. This is what ends up in the atmosphere. This is the two parts per million, which is increasing to perhaps a little bit more than two parts per million. The, these, all these ups and downs are uh, difficult to quantify properly, but, it, but uh, it, it, it's more or less different years. But on an average, this is what's happening. We're ending up with two, two parts per million here. And then there's a land sink and there's an ocean sink. The land sink is what we have direct contact with and we can really look after. The ocean sink, well, we should be looking after it. It's more complicated. But obviously, the interest is this sequestration. This is what we should be persuading our politicians to look after. The biosphere here is tremendously important. 
the lithosphere, the crust underneath our feet is important for sequestration, I think, as an emergency. This is the thing we have to promote as best we can. Because the more we can take out, the more we can handle it here, the less this will increase. And this increase may be entirely positive. Thus, there are at least two plausible hypotheses. They're not paradigms, they're not facts. And we read about facts in the newspaper every day. And every time you read the word fact, you know that it's rubbish. But who knows it's rubbish? 10% of the readers. CO2 is having a significant impact on temperature, maybe for now, but it will in the long term, 100 years. I would say that what we know about carbon dioxide being eaten in the biosphere, this is not a problem at all. But of course, this we're dealing with a hypothesis. We can't be sure. CO2 is not having a significant impact on temperature and won't in the future, providing we concentrate on promoting sequestration in the biosphere. And then I drive home to Sweden, and I drive past lorry after lorry after lorry, loads of Norwegian forests being transported to Sweden. Why? I mean, it's, it, it's because the Swedish government is intent on making the biosphere, um, the forest industry, 95% uh, of which is managed, in other words, you let a tree grow to about 60 or 70 and then you kill it and replant and so on. Um, if one really focused on all those trees being built, put into buildings, then we could really have a, a good, a good promote segregation system. But all of, all of that biosphere that goes into fuels, for some reason, in people's minds, these are sacred. Bio carbon dioxide from biofuels is, is absolutely okay. But from fossil fuels, which are so much cheaper, <laughs> are, uh, are a danger for the planet. There's no sense in making the difference. If you're going to use the biofuels, then you should sequestrate. But the sequestration is going on in the biosphere, and that's what we need to promote more than anything else. Okay, we, we could um, read this, but I mean, it, the water, I think this is the, these are fairly obvious things. The water vapor is the vastly, the vastly dominating greenhouse gas. The cloud formation dissipation is the most important factor of control. The, the meteorologist thinks that water vapor and clouds are passive layers responding only to temperature change, but we don't know. That's just one hypothesis, and it's almost certainly an oversimplified. CO2 is unusually low levels. Of course, in the yard, much, much, much higher. The planet is not in danger. There's a slight chance of sea level rise, um, but the sea level rise has been steady for a long time at about two millimeters a year. Um, we get an idea from the ice cores of what it's been like. CO2 has followed temperature. CO2 always follows temperature in the past, both up and down, several hundred years afterwards. But what does that tell you? That tells you that the CO2 um, is in some way interacting with the ocean, where it's been stored, and its release comes later if you warm enough, and warm enough, and up enough. So it's got to be this. The sun steering the temperature. Um, maybe the amounts of CO2 are just not enough to do anything during the coming hundred years, perhaps longer. Maybe we can double, even treble the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere without influencing temperature. Okay, just a simple picture which always comes up. I mean, this is what we had over those years, 98. From that, from that El Nino. Thereafter, uh, to, to uh, 2007 this year, which is the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, we saw then carbon dioxide goes straight on off, up and uh, temperature shift. And then, when we are weighing hypotheses all the time, 
we don't know whether one hypothesis is right or other one is wrong. We need to have this in our back pocket that we can actually, if necessary, from all point sources, easily take the carbon dioxide and put it in the ground. And that that back uh, backstop, as it were, is something that we need to have to be sure that um, if we don't manage to promote the biosphere enough and keep the biosphere sequestrated, then um, then we have another way out. But but it, it's going to take a long time to see what happens because if the present trend today goes on, it looks very positive. So you know. I'm no longer an agnostic, really. I'm a scientist, and I don't think that we have a certain answer anyway. But I remember very well um, when I learned what the word agnostic means. And that, I must tell you, was a fantastic occasion when I had nothing to do in Edinburgh but went to a football match. And it was Glasgow against Edinburgh, Celtic. And I was sitting in the crowd enjoying myself, and suddenly the home team scored a goal. And they applauded like mad. All right. And I thought. But then, ten minutes later, the other side, from Celtic, from Glasgow, got a goal. I just responded. The honest broker, I suppose. Not a person around me. And then someone looked at me and said, You. Mm. Bloody agnostic. And I happily used the word agnostic for my own position for a long time until I realized that I couldn't applaud IPCC in any way. It was obviously misusing science. So, no more agnostic. But still, as a scientist, you've got to have your mind wide open. So, what do we should be doing? Where we should be? thinking very hard about the population growth and knowing that education is an absolute key here. We've got to have food for people, we've got to have energy for them, we have to have sympathy for the Indians deciding to go flat out for coal to make certain that the whole country is electrified. We have to accept that the Chinese have made up their mind what balance there should be between sun, wind, coal, nuclear, and all the other things. They're very smart on that. Um, that we must protect biodiversity more. 95% of Sweden's forests are managed and by biodiversity you couldn't give a shit. Only small parts. And there is some tendency to understand that actually the forests grow a bit better if you accept that it's a more diverse population of trees and etc. And then, uh, of course, the atmosphere contamination, and that, that's at the sort of London level of, of the 50s or the Beijing level today. We've got to do something about the, the, the contamination, at least in the, in the urban areas. And water supply, and then promote competitive renew, uh, renewable energy. But it's got to be competitive. And we've been investing incredible amounts, but the Western investments that we've had are nothing compared with what the Germans have done. And what is the pattern in Germany? The price of electricity has more than doubled in the last uh, half a dozen years or so. And then, um, if we go back to this, no, let's let's not go any further than this. Let's just um, see. Well, this this is what we have to live with. Yes, I was going to show you that one. Um, obviously, when there are changes of this scale, we're going to see very big changes, uh, dramatic events around the world. And something like this, we should not at all be surprised with. This was the same day in 2007 when they got the Nobel Prize, and this was the year after. And so my hope is that uh, when we have a year like this, um, we'll find a situation, I'm almost finished, when um, we're in a situation where we have all the IPCC uh, positive people heading out in their boat. And what was the name of the boat? Well, with a little bit of luck, it might be the Titanic. 
Um, and I'm afraid that uh, Ryan uh, Felt, our Prime Minister, actually got on board. Uh, but their chances of survival, well, it's open. So, thank you very much. I'm sorry it's taken so long, an hour. But um, there you have a perspective, and you have hypotheses, and you have to choose.